to be here at the Institute of International and European Affairs. And I think this is a very good setting, in fact, to talk about energy, because energy is becoming more and more, and more intertwined with uh, international affairs and geopolitics. So what I'd like to today is uh, show you briefly the key findings from our latest World Energy Outlook. It's a 600-page analysis. Some of you may be familiar with it. And I'd like to synthesize the key findings. Uh, the World Energy Outlook is the IA's report in which we try to show our perspective for the next 20 years, how the energy sector can evolve. Uh, we don't assume technological breakthroughs necessarily, and we try to focus more on the economics of energy and how matters could evolve. Of course, before discussing um, the, the future, it's also worthwhile to take stock of what's currently happening in the energy markets and actually what we see already. Uh, one issue is that some long-held long tenants of the energy sector are actually already changing and happening. Uh, one key example here is the issue of that countries that we were assuming would be in the future large energy importers are actually going to become exporters. And here the United States is a clear example. Uh, in 2005, many people were expecting the United States to be a large, to become a large importer of natural gas, and they're soon, within a couple of years, going to be actually an exporter of natural gas. The other aspect of switching roles is that there are actually consumers that will become exporters, that will actually become more and more important consumers of energy. Here, a prime example is the Middle East. Many of us assume the Middle East is a region there on the map that has a lot of resources and is destined to supply this energy to us in, in other countries. Well, actually, if you look at our numbers, the Middle East will become the second largest consumer of natural gas in the future, overtaking uh, the European Union. And also the Middle East will actually become the third largest consuming region of oil. So it's a region that we were assuming would provide us with energy, and they will continue so, but they will also continue, they will use more of that energy domestically. In the energy sector, of course, there are many global challenges that we are facing. One of them is, of course, uh, uh, climate change. Uh, based on our numbers, in 2012, uh, CO2 emissions reached uh, a record level of 31 0.1 gigatons of CO2 emissions, so another record high, and all of this despite all of the efforts that we're making on energy efficiency and renewables. One of the reasons why the world is not able to tap ideally into energy efficiency, that's because today 544 billion US dollars are being spent globally on subsidizing fossil fuels. And these subsidies are leading to an inefficient use of this energy and unfortunately generating unnecessary emissions. From a development perspective, there's 1.3 billion people today. So that's about 20% of the global population that actually don't have access to electricity. The majority of these people are living in India and also in sub-Saharan Africa and 2.6 billion people lack clean cooking facilities. So we are talking here about uh, women each day having to carry on their heads a lot of traditional biomass so as to cook meals and therefore not being able to spend time on education. And also this has unnecessary health impacts with uh, more than 1.3 million people each year dying from indoor air pollution, more than from malaria. In terms of context of the world energy scene, I think it's also worthwhile, and you see this in the media all of the time, especially if you're in Europe, but also in Japan, uh, energy prices are becoming a key pressure point for policymakers, especially as they keep on rising. And in my slides later, I will show you our in-depth analysis on the issue of energy and competitiveness that you will find in this world energy outlook. So we're already facing sustained high oil prices, if you take the average of the last three years of the oil price in Europe, the Brent price, you actually notice that that price 
has averaged $110 per barrel over the last three years, the oil price in Europe. And if you compare that with history, we've actually never seen such a prolonged period of high oil prices. So we ourselves are actually living in the period of the longest prolonged high oil prices. And there's also growing disparities in terms of regional gas and electricity prices. So if we look at the future, and in the World Energy Outlook, you have three scenarios. In this presentation, I will focus on our most likely scenario, which we call the new policy scenario, in which we take stock of the policies that are currently in place, and we take assumptions on which policies are likely to be introduced by governments. We do take a conservative approach to this, but we believe this is the most likely view of the future of the world in that governments will implement new policies. One example here of a policy is, for example, we assume that China will introduce a national CO2 price in their energy system as of 2020. If we look at the future, we see that uh, countries such as United States, Europe and Japan that make up um, the majority of energy used in the emerging economies are actually not going to be accounting for the majority of incremental energy demand growth. In, a lot, in some of these countries, population is declining. We've reached a certain saturation point in terms of energy use. And we're also becoming more and more efficient. And our economies are not growing as fast as the key energy demand centers, and that being China, India, and Southeast Asia. We expect... Uh, Asian countries, emerging Asian countries, to actually account for the bulk of energy demand growth going forward. And there's an interesting insight here in that when you look at our Asian energy demand trends, you will actually notice that China is in the leader in the first decade up to 2020, and then actually Chinese energy demand growth starts slowing down from the high historical growth rates, and India steps in as the key motor of future energy demand growth. And of course, other key regions such as the Middle East, Africa, and Latin America also contribute to the growth in energy. If we look at the fuels, and before we look at the projections, what you see here is 25 years of history, of energy history. So this is not projections, this is actual uh, historical data. And what you can see here is that clearly fossil fuels were the leader in terms of global energy demand growth. Coal number one, gas second, and oil. So therefore, if you look at the share of fossil fuels in today's energy mix, they're about 82%. 82% of our energy we're getting from coal, oil, and gas today. And if you go back 25 years, you will actually notice that that share hasn't changed. It, is, it was also 82% 25 years. So despite all the efforts that are being done towards decarbonization and promoting energy efficiency, we're actually, if you want, over 25 years still in the same point that fossil fuels are key for our energy sector. And going forward in our scenario, due to the strong penetration of renewables into the energy mix, there is actually the share of fossil fuels declines to 75%. So there is a decarbonization that happens, but even in 2035, 20 years down the road, three fourths of our energy will be coming from fossil fuels. These fossil fuels, as you're all aware, have uh, an environmental influence in that they generate CO2 emissions. And the world is aspiring for a two degrees Celsius target of minimizing the increase in long-term uh, temperature to, to two degrees. Um, it's in all the institutions, UNFCC, G20, European Union, everybody's aspiring for this target. But based on our scenario, we actually see the world reaching a 3.4 degrees Celsius increase in global temperature. So we're actually not yet there in terms of getting the world on a sustainable energy path. There's still 
quite a bit of new policies, bold measures that have to be made to attain that. So we're not on a sustainable path. Therefore, negotiations have to become more and more stringent and bold. And the key next milestone is actually going to take place in uh, Paris, in France, in 2015. That's when there's going to be the, the next COP meeting. We just had one COP meeting in Warsaw. But the one in 2015 in Paris is supposed to actually decide on the new global climate agreement and then we will have five years to implement it. So th in theory, current negotiations are expiring that by 2020 we will have a new global climate accord. Why do I mention this? Because in the negotiations, often the, the discussion is that we developing countries should not be constrained in any way by the climate accord because we are developing and you, the Western world, you have developed. Now if you look at the history, you can see here in blue that indeed the OECD countries were the, the main emitter of CO2 emissions. <coughs> but if we look at things from a cumulative perspective, from 1900 to 2035, so more than 135 years of energy history, you will actually notice that this balance will become half and half. So therefore, in the negotiations, actually developing economies are going to find it hard to put forward the argument that we're not the culprit for, for climate change. Of course, when you look at it on a per capita emissions, United States will be more than double than China in terms of per capita emissions. But still, in the end, for the energy system, it's not per capita emissions that matter, but it's the cumulative energy that's put into the system. So one of the solutions, of course, for climate change is also promoting more uh, renewables. And in fact, uh, renewables uh, account for nearly half of the increase in electricity generation in our scenario. And you have of the developing econo developed economies such as the European Union, Japan, and United States fostering this renewables growth. You have the the green revolution also taking place in countries such as India, Latin America, Africa, and ASEAN. But actually the key player in it is China. China alone will actually produce more renewable energy to 2035 than the European Union, Japan, and United States put together. A lot of this uh, incremental Renewable energy in China will come from hydro, because China has still uh, abundant resources of hydro that it can tap into. So does the rest of the world, for example, India uh, and Brazil. But in our developed countries, Europe, Japan and United States, we've actually utilized the majority of our hydro potential. So therefore, we will have to invest more in wind and also in solar photovoltaics. And these technologies are still uneconomic compared to fossil fuels. Therefore, we will have to somehow foster them. And most often, this will be through renewable subsidies. Based on our analysis, 100 billion US dollars were spent globally on renewable subsidies in 2012. And we expect renewable subsidies to double to 200 billion US dollars by 2035 just to support this growth in, in energy and to help us decarbonize. If you're familiar with the World Energy Outlook, each World Energy Outlook focuses on a specific fuel. The last time we focused on oil was actually in 2008. But since then, there has been a big revolution in terms of technology, which is called light tight oil. And this this is hydraulic fracturing used to generate oil, which is taking place in North America. So we wanted to look at oil again this year, and we have an in-depth focus on oil in this World Energy Outlook. And what we find is that today's developed countries will actually decrease their oil use going forward because of uh, more efficient vehicles, also turning towards biofuels and electrifications of the vehicle fleet. 
So therefore, the majority of the future growth in oil will actually come from the emerging economies. And China here is a prime example again, because China will overtake the United States by 2030 uh, to become the world's largest consumer of oil. And once again, you can see the importance of Middle East also in consuming oil, not only in producing it. If we look at it from a sectoral approach, clearly, the more and more people develop, the more and more they want access to mobility. So the transport sector is the key uh, growth sector for oil demand. And in fact, there's also a lot of growth in diesel because people need more goods. So more and more heavy freight vehicles are actually being utilized, in, for example, in countries like Asia. And also petrochemicals is the second leading growth sector because of the rampant demand in plastics also as economies develop. I won't go into detail f f for the sake of time, but if you're interested by the refining sector, we actually have a special focus on the refining sector in this World Energy Outlook. And I know refining is a topical issue in Ireland with, with the prospects around one, your one and sole refinery in Ireland. What we actually find, if you look at our analysis, that indeed there will be a m more and more of a glut in terms of refining capacity, in terms of unnecessary refining capacity. And that means that in the future there might be need in certain regions, especially in Europe and North America, to shed some of this refining capacity because it will become uneconomical. Shifting from demand uh, to supply, we see in the oil markets a kind of two chapters in terms of the, what's going to happen in the future in the oil markets. When, when you look at the next uh, 12 years, more or less, you will see that technologies such as offshore drilling will bring Brazil into prominence in the oil markets, and also lightite oil, which is hydraulic fracturing that generates oil in the United States, will result in the US overtaking Saudi Arabia in 2015, so in two years' time, overtaking Saudi Arabia as the largest producer. And we expect the United States to maintain this leading position till the late 2030s before it gets overtaken again by Saudi Arabia. So this technology is really revolutionizing the oil sector. But based on the resources that are today available, we expect this to be a short-term phenomenon. And therefore, afterwards, there will be again another chapter in which the Middle East will once again come to the fore in terms of oil, incremental oil production. And this is a key message for the IEA, because the IEA is often perceived as a watchdog of the energy consumers, but we are in dialogue with our key partners in, in OPEC in Vienna, and what we try to show is that Middle East will still be needed for the oil markets, and therefore it is very crucial that investments are made in that region. I'd like to conclude my presentation by showing you the key findings from our energy and competitiveness analysis in this World Energy Outlook. Uh, there's a lot of talk in the media about energy and competitiveness, and we decided to look at this topic in depth in this World Energy Outlook. All of the buzz in the media is related to the fact that energy prices have grown in certain regions rampantly, whereas in other regions they've stayed subdued. We can see that by going back in history. If you compare Japanese, European, and Chinese natural gas prices to the United States in 2003, so a decade, if we go a decade back, we notice that actually all of these regions were paying similar prices for gas. So the issue of competitiveness wasn't really there when it came to energy. And we just go forward 10 years today, and you can see that in Japan, they're already paying five times as much for natural gas than in the uh, United States, and even Europe is paying three times as much. 
two key factors that have led to this. In the United States, there's been the shale gas revolution, which has created an abundance of natural gas on the market, which has then depressed natural gas prices in the, in the United States. Whereas in Europe and Japan, a lot of our gas contracts are actually oil indexed. And since oil prices have stayed strong over the past three years, gas prices have also stayed strong. So with the two trends going opposite ways, the ratio, the price differential has actually grown between these regions. Going forward, we expect these differentials to uh, decrease, with uh, mainly due to the larger prevalence of LNG on the market, but also natural gas prices in the United States will rise as the natural gas there becomes more expensive to produce. And this will weaken the differentials between the regions. However, they will still persist. And you can also expect a similar situation in electricity markets. Before, there was much less difference between these regions in terms of electricity prices. But going forward, we expect factories in Japan and Europe and even China almost paying double for electricity than in the United States. Now you might ask a question whether this really matters, because there's a lot of buzz in the media, but maybe that's overestimated. But when we looked at the numbers, it's true that on average for most uh, sectors of life, energy accounts for about 10% of your total production costs on average in most sectors. But if you focalize more on the heavy industries, the energy intensive ones, such as petrochemicals, aluminium and cement, our analysis has found that in sectors such as petrochemicals, for example, 80%, 80%, up to 80% of of your total production costs can be just related to energy. And even if you take the sector of cement, you could be even paying 50% of your production costs could be coming from energy. So this is clearly an issue. These price disparities are clearly an issue for uh, energy intensive industries. And these industries, needless to say, do employ 25% uh, of uh, global industrial employment so competitiveness here means, means jobs. So we decided to take forward our analysis and we looked at if you take the price assumptions that we have assumed in our world energy outlook and you couple that with a model that derives trade in energy intensive goods, how will the future look? Today, in fact, the European Union is a leader in terms of exporting energy-intensive goods, about 36% of the market, and the United States is second in place. But our results show that because of the development in many of the developing countries such as China and the Middle East, these, these regions will be able to increase their market share of energy-intensive goods, and the United States will slightly increase its market share because of the cheap natural gas it will have in the future compared to other regions. On the other hand, the European Union and Japan, which will continue to struggle with high energy prices, will actually face a comparative disadvantage in the market, and we expect them together to lose nearly 13 percentage points of their market share. So the European Union will still re remain the largest exporter of energy intensive goods, but its market share will decline by 10%. Of course, this can be changed. There's no silver bullet to helping competitiveness, but there are such tools as energy efficiency, which is critical uh, for improving energy competitiveness. You can also foster indigenous resources, such as uh, renewables, uh, unconventional gas and potentially nuclear if you are in a country that is willing to open towards that technology. You can also foster more 
integration in energy markets, which the European Union is trying to do with its internal energy market reforms. So there are methods and possibilities for us there. It's not uh, one solution. You're going to probably have to tap into a lot of possibilities to improve energy competitiveness. Therefore, policymakers will be grappling with this issue going forward and will have to find the right means towards improving energy competitiveness. So let me just conclude my presentation by recapping the key points. We've seen that the dominance in the energy world will shift towards Asia, especially to China and afterwards to India. This region will become the key driver both of demand and also trade in energy. Technology is changing uh, already currently the energy world and it will change it further with technologies such as hydraulic fracturing that have revolutionized the energy world. But still, in the future, we will be dependent on conventional oil sources such as com those coming from the Middle East. We expect regional price gaps to persist going forward, and therefore the issue of competitiveness will be another key challenge that policymakers will have to struggle with. They've been always struggling with energy security, then they started struggling with climate change, and now they have the third trilemma of energy competitiveness. But of course, we cannot forget about climate change. Even if we're struggling with energy security and we're struggling with energy competitiveness, the headache for the policymakers is how to put how to also foster cl climate change, because at certain times you will, you will see that uh, energy security, climate change, and energy competitiveness not, not necessarily go hand in hand, but we at the International Energy Agency think that energy efficiency is one of those tools that can solve these, this trilemma. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>